So I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to what we're doing today. So we are Club Critical Theory, um, and we're going to celebrate this wonderful piece of um, art. I think the book. This is all about Graham, I think, tonight. Yeah, so. so look, that look good. Honestly, I won't bore you for too long, I promise you. So, a little bit of critical theory. I know, I know some people here who used to go to the event we used to run at the railway, um, which we did a few things. The idea generally is to sort of, you know, we come from universities, a few of us, and we're trying to turn the university inside out, so, you know, you don't have to pay all that bloody money to go to lectures, and you have this sort of stuff for free, right? So that's the idea. Public space is outside the university paywall, right? Just to say, one of the events we run, run the railway back in Crikey, Tim, we were talking about that the other day, five years ago, uh, you know, 2017, before the pandemic, uh, upstairs on the railway, and we did, we did a thing called Seaside Cultures. And uh, I won't go on too much because I think we're going to kind of talk about this as we go. But it's when Graham and Tim first met up and, um, you know, started talking about this idea about alternative cultures and that being part of heritage. Um, I won't go on too much about that because I know you're going to talk about it. Look, I mean, I was going to say, as a, by way of an introduction, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're in education, how do you make this into a subject? Well, it already is a subject. We've got Russ uh, there, who is a graphic designer, who teaches subcultural kind of, you know, uh, studies around this. But I think if it was a subject, the Tories would try to ban it, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, but it's about subcultures, it's about design, it's about fine art, it's about uh, heritage. Christ's sake, you know, heritage is, you know, things like the pier and the Victorian stuff in, in, in South End. But it's also about this stuff, right? Which we want to celebrate as other people celebrate their own heritage and our heritage, right? But I think, from my point of view, it's also about our relationship to technology. I mean, I grew up on Letraset. Anyone remember Letraset here? Oh, yeah. You're all <laughs> I love Letraset. You know, Letraset is an art movement. We've got some uh, PhD students here who are studying things like DIY uh, movements, right? So it is a subject. You know, all that DTP stuff we went through. I mean, my big argument about this is that we went from uh, a period of time when the web started, you know, when people were using HTML in a way you would do a fanzine. Unfortunately, when Web 2.0 came along, it kind of crushed it, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, I'm willing to hear another counter-argument to that one. Three. Anyway, let's introduce people. So, a round of applause for Graham Burnett. Yeah. I'm not going to read all of this, but, you know, let's, let's see. The guy came to South End, right? You didn't, you weren't here from here originally, Graham, so where were you from? Uh, Whitford. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't admit that, don't admit that here. Life. He's from Whitford. <laughs> Whitford? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, so anyway, he didn't say that. Um, anyway, he's been here for a long, long time. And, uh, yeah. he's, been, he's been doing it himself for ages, and it, it, this, this book, you know, personifies, you know, or says the wrong word, <laughs> embodies you know, do-it-yourself culture, right? Uh, we've got Kelly Buckley, right? Kelly? Hey. So, again, I'm not going to patronise you by reading the whole of Kelly's thing, but Naked Tongue was a thing that you produced, yeah? We'll hear about a lot about that, yeah? And with your co-producer? Claire. Claire. Ooh, wow. okay. <laughs> we have Russ. Bestly, and, uh, and Russ is our special guest in a way because you've travelled from Devon, haven't you? Jesus Christ, sir. <laughs> to be here especially. But uh, Russ is our, you know, the academic guy. Um, he's the, the, the editor. Oh, don't, don't be embarrassed about that, Russ. Is <laughs> uh, he's the editor of uh, Punk and Post Punk, which is a journal, yeah, just showing you that he's actually a subject of, of studying this stuff. Um, and there's a little bit about Russ, but we hear a lot back from Russ. We have Sophia Rawlinson. Yeah. Great. And I don't know if anyone remembers the Essex fans in Noisy, but you tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. Excellent. And, oops, <laughs> I've gone the wrong way. There we go. And finally, we have uh, our, our chair, right, who I hand over the, uh, the talk to, but is Tim Burrows. Tim Burrows, uh, I, I know him from writing about Essex and the Guardian, which is great, because you know, we hear about Essex, and I know you also, you're a South End boy, aren't you? Yeah? Albeit somewhere about no, Belfares. No, if you're local, you know that's not that's not cool, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
So Tim, over to you, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is an amazing turnout. It's crazy, isn't it? Uh, I just think, how many people here have made it? See, I mean, I just sort of yeah. feel like. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's like, it's I, 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 I don't know. But it's very, very much speaks to this area of really, um, the kind of DIY element of self-made culture around here. The amount of venues that have that still are here and have been here for the years. I mean, I did, I did kind of when they when they said it was sold out. Should I put it closer to me? Um, yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk to me. Um, when they said it was sold out, I kind of wasn't that surprised. So it's really cool. So thanks for coming down. Um, so in this book has a genesis of, I was quite surprised when Graham Green Tyson Street <laughs> made this book and that it was inspired partly um, uh, during a conversation we had when I was doing a panel with these guys in the railway hotel and Graham was in the audience. I think we were talking about um, South North Scene scene. I think you brought that up and you said no one ever really talks about this and like what a kind of like lineage there is here and what this sort of there is this sort of like on you know this invisible kind of republic of South End um, DIY culture which you know people do know about a bit but it's never been documented and I, I think I don't know I mean you I was surprised because I couldn't I could I could just about remember this conversation but you come out with that you have gone away and actually made the book. But I think I think um we were you, you were kind of saying there isn't one and yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, this was the conversation. It's about South End. I mean, I guess most people in this room are from South End, and if you kind of if you go anywhere outside of South End, and people say, "Where are you from?" So South End, and you get that kind of slightly condescending snigger about, <laughs> "Oh, um, Essex girls, oh, the yeah, Towie, and oh, White Van Man, oh, the Fist and Quick Hats, and everything," and. Just so you know, there, there is actually this whole, okay, there's some truth to that um, stereotype. I think all stereotypes have an element of truth to them. I mean, we had, you know, we had our own Saxon King of Bling 1300 years ago, so we, we kind of did start the trend. But there is, you know, but joking aside, there is kind of, you know, a rich, deep, radical culture that's kind of, you know, there as well, that's part of the South End story as well, I feel. And so again, this conversation was kind of going on, and I think the question came, well, where, where is this history documented? And I kind of said, well, it'd be in all these, like, these fanzines and people's papers and um, community press publications that people put out years and years ago. And I think you said to me, well, well where can we see these? And I was like, and, you know, has anyone documented this? And I was like, I suppose that would be me then. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and so I guess that was the starting point, really, and it kind of grew from there. It was a bit of a side project for me at first. I was working on something else, but it became, you know, the kind of the main project I was working on. So yeah. What, what did you? Did you? Where did you start? I suppose it's a question. Did you have some? You know, did you have a bulk of them in your loft? Or did you think well, I've got a list of names I would start off with, and then it just sort of snowballed? And uh, yeah, what was, the, what was the starting process of putting it together? I suppose. Um, yeah, I guess I mean I've, I used to have quite an extensive collection of sort of things, not just in South End, but um, you know around the country and internationally. And of course, I've lost them over the years. But, you know, I mean, that's one of the things about these publications; they were never intended as. Artifacts, they were kind of off the moment, they were ephemeral, so people didn't look after them. They kind of like gave them away or they threw them out or passed them on to other people or lost them or whatever. So it kind of started with my needed collection, but also just talking to people. Um, I'm, not, well, I'm not sure where Ron is, but Ron did the Precinct Press, did it, did it, did it, did it over there at the back. He would quite often chat and he'd tell me these stories about. Um, Kind of the community whole food co-op that they used to run back in the early 1970s and the um, kind of radical theatre groups and all these things that South in Action Group for the Arts and they're putting on all these different things. And Ron would, you know, we'd have these conversations and I just thought this really needs to be captured, you know. And I mean who knew that in I don't know, we, we can't remember quite which year, but um, someone put on a, a live 13-piece percussion 
um, stock cows and beefs in the middle of South End High Street. Is that the afternoon? I mean, you know. <laughs> what was that all about? <laughs> you know, and, and yes, yeah, so I was through, you know, through all history, really, and the need to kind of capture that while while we still can. So, so that was the starting point. Do you think South End was there a particular need for an alternative for the scene? I mean, was there a kind of deep, I mean, I know you made true crimes. New, new club, sorry. Not, no, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a that's, a, that's a podcast, John. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, do you feel like, what do you feel like the impetus was for, the, for this, kind of, this fertile underground? And, and where do you think, you know, if we're talking about South End Zines, if we were, if we were to say the, you know, the scene started and the kind of, the bulk of the, the matter that you found, where does it kind of like start happening? I guess I can only speak from my own uh, experience, and it was that time, you know, punk when everybody, everybody in their dog was making a band and kind of thing, so it was part of that. I think the emphasis for me and the group, I would, you know, my, there were three of us who started up originally, and part of it was. You know, it's a bit ironic really, we were reacting against the, um, there was that kind of whole thing around Dr. Feelgood and the uh, R&B stuff and pub rock and all that. It was quite ironic because Dr. Feelgood in, in their turn was kind of a reaction against kind of prog rock, that kind of early 70s, you know, overproduced music from California that would be dominating music around that time. Um, so I don't kind of reaction against that when you think back to basics. But our experience in South End was every pub in South End would be full of some band, like a third rate imitation that the field was doing, you know, <laughs> getting yes. kicks on Route 66 and Johnny be good and all this kind of thing. And we, we hated that and thought it was so boring. And that's why we kind of thought that was the impetus to kind of start punk kind of fans, I guess. So that was our impetus in a way. I think even since then, punk's become kind of reductive in the same way Dr. Phil became reductive. And actually, what's interesting about Looking at um, new crimes and the scene, uh, this, the, the zine, sorry, not scene, um, this book on zines is uh, the, the kind of avant garde, uh, free improv mm. sort of side of South End that definitely doesn't really get much um, when people talk about you know, South East things. I, just thought, I mean, how, just very briefly to well, kind of open this up a little, little bit, but like, how, how do you think that? There was a kinship there. I mean, do you think that that was literally trying to get that stuff out there, where it was being drowned out by things like twelve bar blues and very much. I think you know that was very much you know the, the Thames Delta scene was very well documented, as we all know. But um, also, what was going on through people like like Trevor Taylor, who's <laughs> around somewhere in the audience, but um, there he is, he's waving back. He was putting on a lot of kind of free improv and avant-garde music. Maybe that's something to do with that stock album thing, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there was very much this other scene that was kind of going on as well, I think. As you say, you know, kind of radical improv music, free jazz, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think the South End has always been very fertile in terms of the diversity of what it offers in terms of music and culture, I think. And, and Kelly, I'm going to move um, to you because I think you have your sorry. I think. Hold the mic. Hold it. Hold it. Make sure you speak into the mic, That's it. Great. Um, just, I, I mean, you, your um, naked tongue started slightly later, and it didn't actually start in South, and it sort of migrated here like all yeah. good cockney. <laughs> and like everything ends up in South End, like just there. Um, but you sort of became really ingratiated in, in you know, the music scene here, like, the cultural scene here. Yeah. I think uh, you told me um, about some of your problems with getting advertising because of some of the more kind of avant-garde, uh, like, pictures. In, so, yes. I mean, Naked Time was the kind of was carrying on Similar it was. It was very much a zine, and we had that kind of. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to create something that was very DIY. But we were kind of, as Graham was just talking about, in the sense of music kicking against 
what was going on. We were kind of kicking against kind of the glosses. I don't know, there was like a lot of pretentiousness, the face or whatever it was at the time. And so the idea was to create a, a really DIY magazine, but run it professionally <laughs> as, a, as a magazine and get advertising and, you know, make this a business. And um, so, yeah, we, we did find that the flaw in the plan, <laughs> which we didn't realise until after we put loads of money into it, um, was that, um, yeah, we, we were all about promoting independence, um, independent shops, independent artists, makers, you know, um, musicians. And um, so the people that had the money to advertise didn't really want to advertise uh, put their money into a magazine where you know we had we, we covered things such as art stuff where a girl was projecting the word cunt onto people's faces and so you know we came across a lot of that <laughs> and also snobbery as well about because we were we were East London and Essex parts of Essex and we would sort of go around and look at where there were kind of good scenes and obviously South End we discovered had a really good scene. And so, um, but to then to go into these London shops and go, you know, we've got South End, and they'd be like, what? South End? South End? What? And so we had to really, really sell this. Um, and, you know, this, this whole Essex London thing, this, this divide. Yeah. Oh, I just, uh, I think that's the, the problem with journalism in a nutshell, isn't it? Like, you basically think that you can really sell this with really the avant-garde stuff and when, when it comes down to it, it's like number crunching. Yeah. But like, um, I don't know, I mean, did you, because I think what we were talking about in discussions before when we were sort of on chats with each other and just tonight, just about the kind of um, evolution of scenes from, I think um, Tony touched on it as well, like the technological evolution, because I think, uh, Graham, how did, how did you, Make scenes. Did you, did, was it Xerox? Sort of like, did you have a typewriter? Or um, yeah, um, it, well, we were, we were calling it almost pre Xerox. We had this old duplicator, um, this Stetler duplicator, where you'd, um, you had to type onto these kind of wax stencil sheets and then you kind of tap onto this drum and you turn the handle. You'd fill this drum up with ink and you turn the handle and like, it would print the pages kind of one at a time, you know, the old idea of a printing press. And we kind of picked that up from, well it's interesting, I think there is this kind of lineage, because I inherited that, um, this Stetner from Bang Magazine, who um, were another magazine that I covered in, in the book. Uh, I bought it for 20 quid. And yeah, so it was really kind of primitive technology. You're just doing the best you can with, with kind of what you've got really. Thing. And it's quite interesting how we were having a chat about this earlier, um, how those technologies are almost kind of fetishised in a way. Um, you know, I've had people say, yeah, it must be so fantastic to use the, you know, this old school technology, you know, real object. No, it's fucking horrible. You know, really, you know, we would have killed for desktop publishing, you know. You know. And it's lovely now if I produce something, you know, I'll send a, like the book, I've sent a PDF off to the printers, two weeks later, there it is, all collated in a box. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and Kenny, so, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? So you didn't, you would have, I mean, I remember friends of mine would make them in the old fashioned way just because there was this sort of um, nostalgia to it and this sort of fetishization of that. And you think, I think growing up, a few years into punk and rock and roll, there, there, there generally, generally is among the young a sort of curiosity as to why um, you know they have, don't have it the same way, and so sometimes you want to go back to it, but you didn't. You sort of there was, it was almost like a kind of there was that there was a stylistic looking at some of the issues, but it's a stylistic kind of nod to the Z, but they are treated they're kind of like glossy. So yeah. how did what was your set? Well, set I mean because I'd, I'd already been. A journalist, and I was already working in his papers before I went off and decided to do this. So I was I was using Quark and you know laying it all out it's professionally. As I say, we were trying to run it as a business. Claire's over there. Claire was doing it with me, and um, so you know we wanted to get it done. But we but uh, yeah, it was all kind of everything was really you know 
asking away from me, would just go and stick a box there, stick a text box yeah. there, whack it in. I mean, it looked shit, really. It was kind of like, when I show people now, I'm like, oh, it's really cringe. And, um, you know, and a lot of it, we didn't really know what we were doing, actually. So that, it was authentic in that way. <laughs> Um, but and it started like late 90s, kind of millennium. Yeah, it was very <clears throat> late 90s, um, the start of the 2000s. We had, I think we had our pilot one, or a prototype out at the end of, was it 1999, I think? And then we had the first one out in 2000, 2000 I think. I think that was it. Um, yeah. Um, Sophia, uh, um, you're seeing noisy. It was only a little after that and I think having a look at I think it's one of the most it's such a prolific um, account I thought I had a look at noisy before <coughs> before we started tonight and it's a very you, the amount of gigs that you went to in, in South End and South Essex and all around like I could see like South Minster and Denji yeah. or like <coughs> or around South End or kind of Castle Point mm -hmm. and the like yeah. you were just, I mean, that kind of reflects the intensity of the live music circuit at that time. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. As we, um, as we were discussing earlier, there was pretty much a gig almost every night of the week, at, you know, in the late 2000s, and uh, they were, some were sparsely attended, some were really, you know, well attended, and uh, it's, yeah, what we created was pretty much a... Uh, a reflection of, of what was happening all across the county, but I'm obviously near the South End, so we had a little bit of a South End bias, I suppose. What made you want to start it? And did you did you have any influence from you know scenes of the past? This sort of like you know the, the punk era. Sort of? uh, well, not so much the punk era, but I I got into fanzines when I was a teenager. I I came across a magazine called Sessions, which was a short-lived music magazine that I discovered in the late nineties. Um, and they had a section on, on fanzines, and I thought, these are fantastic, I'll, I'll send off for a few. So I got one, and it was sort of probably late 90s indie. Um, and from there, I sort of did my own thing, random fanzines, you know, just said, it was very, it wasn't a community thing, but it was a, it was a cuisine community, but it wasn't necessarily on a local level. Yeah. Um, I was sort of sending off for stuff, you know, up north, down south, yeah. you know, all over. And then um, in sort of around about 2003, 2004, I saw some local bands, and in particular, um, one called Trash Munro, who are still going now. They're a uh, female fronted goth metal right, yeah. act that yeah, you yeah. can see at probably Chinnery's or, or wherever at the moment. Um, and I just thought the, the talent we've got here is, you know, it's fantastic. And you could find your next favourite band, you know, playing in the next town over, um, rather than necessarily what was going to be on the front of Enemy or Q Magazine, which was still back then sort of very much gatekeeping you know, yeah. and radio now, which it's certainly been obviously blown apart a bit by the advent, of, well, not advent, but you know, the yeah. proliferation of the internet and YouTube and Spotify, which yeah. didn't quite exist then. So, yeah, the. the uh, I'm sorry, really no, I mean, I think that's really interesting because you sort of caught that last moment. I think the noughties was a sort yeah. of moment where I think I, I was involved, you know, there's lots of people here who were making, putting on nights or putting on gigs in the noughties and you sort of felt like you were, you were continuing what's been going on for years whilst also maybe knowing that things were changing really rapidly around you with things like Maps and Spotify um, and just the nature of music yeah. sort of changing, the nature of gatekeeping changing, yeah. that's all. Because these things are, were done because nobody could find out who the editor of Q was, you know. Yeah. Like, oh, he wasn't answering the phone and you just needed to do this to somehow exchange information and also document. Absolutely, and I think was, it's probably also important to, to sort of state that the internet did sort of help us as well, you know, you could, you could direct people to only freeze or, I mean, nowadays you've got QR codes and things like that, but uh, yeah, the internet certainly um, certainly complemented it later on, and like, that's where I was getting a lot of information from, but it was, you know, whereas now you go on YouTube, you watch a video and you don't get anything of it, back then it was still a nightmare with download speeds and stuff like that. So I was getting a lot of CDs and physical stuff sent or, or going to gigs, but uh, the internet did play part. MySpace, obviously, back in those days, was uh, how we found out about a lot of gigs and uh, a lot of bands. So, yeah, they co it coexisted at that point. I guess. Yes, and I don't know, when you look at them, I mean, Russ, I want to bring you in as a, like a, as somebody who looks at zines like a, a, a general um, 
a more, in a, in a more academic sense, but also in a very graphic and visual sense. Yeah. Looking at this book and looking at the things that are available to look at, I, I mean, <coughs> they're, they're, they're just, I mean, there is a commonality between all of them. Is a lot of them are they're very direct. Like that was the role of the zine. It was we wanted them to make a visual punch, especially to kind of reflect the yeah, cultural so. norms. But do you think you know that sort of did the graphic? What, was it, is the style of the zine reflected by the subculture, or was it literally because you had to just put this information out there and make it? Bold? I think I think we can we can consider the, the the form and the content of the zines. I think it's really interesting to see a discussion so far that there's been. We've touched on technology, that we've talked about from the Estetna to Quark Express uh, desktop publishing, um, and we've kind of made that leap. I think there's some stereotypes about fanzines. My work is very much in punk, I'm part of the Scholars Network, um, and there's almost a stereotype of zines. Oh, yeah, they're photocopied and they're done in a particular way, but uh, as Graham said, in, in 1977, photocopies were quite hard to come by happen to be in offices from banks or accountants uh, and, uh, and quite difficult to access. So Gesetna, or if you could access a photocopy, a very, very short run if you could do that. And they were very expensive, and very expensive to photocopy. So, when, so Mark Perry, when he was really made Sniffing Blue, um, did the first 50 copies, I think, on his girlfriend's dad's photocopier. After that, it was it was lipo printed. It was, it was taken to a print shop and, and lipo printed. It wasn't, it wasn't photocopied. Um, and there's a lot of stereotypes that go with the technology. The style is done in a particular way. And there's also content that, that you know, I think there, there's, a, there's a tradition that goes, goes back more than 100 years to the Victorian era of pamphleting, uh, of leafleting, and, uh, and something as an alternative to the mainstream. And in, in the punk era, it's an alternative to the mainstream music press. Nobody's reporting about this stuff. So we're going to we're going to report that. So that's something I think is continued on the way through to, to you guys and the music of the, the two thousands. No one's reporting on this kind of style or this music, or no one's reporting on us in our town because it's all focused on the snobbies in East London or whatever it might be. I grew up in Kent and yeah, and, and, and spent a lot of my time in South it's on the South Coast, and uh, and it was the same thing. Seaside towns that were kind of left out of the narrative. Um, the local band where I grew up was the anti Nova League, did a song called Whoa. So What. I've been to Hastings, I've been to Eastbourne, and, you know, uh, I've been to Brighton, I've been to Eastbourne too, So What. And it was, these are the coastal towns, this is, you know, the, the bigging up something that is ignored in the mainstream. So if we've got the form and content, I think it's important to discuss those two things. And I'm a bit of a fetishist about print and about you know, the mechanics of making. Uh, that isn't just an aesthetic, it's not just a choice. When I talked to Mark Perry about Sniffing Blue, he said, I wanted to make a proper magazine. So I went to the news agents and saw, well, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big title at the top, and then there's a bit underneath it that says what the price is and what the date is, and then there's bits that say, big words that say this is what the content is. And the tools that he had was a, a typewriter and a marker pen. So how do you do a big title when you try and do it big with a marker pen? That's, it, it, it's not just an aesthetic choice, it's a choice that's determined by the tools that you've got. And that's something I think is really important to consider with all of these things. And, that, and actually, where we flip onto nostalgia and fetishizing a fanzine aesthetic, but we've got to be aware of that, that it becomes fetishizing something that was driven by something other than the way it looks. It, was, you know, it came out that way because of the tools and the means and the skill of the people that made it, not an aesthetic choice. Mark Perry didn't want to make a, a shitty looking magazine. He wanted to make a very sophisticated magazine, but he didn't have the tools to do it. I'm sure that's the same with Graham and New Crimes. You know, yeah, it would have been great if it was a glossy, sort of full colour, you know, proper magazine, but you, know, you use what you've got. Um, I suppose I don't want to move too forward in time, but um, well, we're there anyway. In the, uh, South End Zines today, I mean, what is the answer to the question of like, uh, what is the South End Zine today, Graham? I mean, is there, is there, is there any sense of like that having shifted over time? I know, um, I don't know if um, James Taylor's here tonight, but I, I know that you featured his I remember like seeing um, your uh, seeing managed retreat in the railway. And the railway hotel was um, uh, just a very that was a 
I mean, because I think I made the comment before we were doing this tonight, it seems sort of in their physical nature, they need a physical space to be in, otherwise they don't find them. And so it's quite hard to just put them on the side of a small cafe or a small bar. You kind of need them to sit somewhere. Um, and that's usually a venue, or that's usually some, especially a venue where somebody's giving them or exchanging them. So, like, <clears throat> so the, like, the railway up until it closed just had a corner <laughs> where there was just lots of scenes piled up. And I remember seeing Managed Retreat, which was uh, a very thoughtful look at um, the ecology and the ecological issues specific to uh, South Essex. Um, things like actually riffing on Managed Retreat, which is a, which is a kind of climate change era um, uh, uh, a way of dealing with rising sea levels, but also kind of playing with that as well. And I just remember it was kind of quite a, a multi-layered sort of multi-cultural cultural sort of thing. But, so, you know, the, the, the environment, I mean, it's not just and your work in the environment, it's not just music is not, I mean, we think of zines and music, it's very like simple package back then, but do you think, do you see the zine is sort of surviving that way perhaps? Yeah, I, I think they do, yeah, um, I think, yeah, Chambers' uh, publication was a good example, I think, um, and there's Lou Williams, who's doing the, the girls in the girl, girls in stuff, G-R-R-L, um, so, um, yeah, so I guess how is it different? I guess it is different because in my day, back in my day, uh, it was like it, that was all we had to communicate. That was how you found out what bands were playing, what gigs were on, and you know, so it was kind of the closest thing we had to social media then. And obviously, well, we have social media now, so I guess it's not really so much about that. I guess they're a lot more, um, I guess they're a lot more kind of personal, I think, a lot of the zines that are around now. They're not so much about putting out this information so you know what bands are playing. Although well, there is still an element of that, I think. Um, but it's kind of about people kind of sharing their thoughts, you know, and their, their art, making their art accessible in ways it might not be, you know, like if you can't get your stuff into a gallery or something, that's a matter, you just produce a little hopefully a little zine and that's a great way of expressing you know through that and I think there is still through um, um, there was Trawler which is quite interesting looking at I don't know if people remember Trawler that was out Poetry. a few years ago no no it was kind of local arts and culture really wasn't it and you know the aesthetics and the production values and you know the um, designer kind of Chops are obviously a lot higher than, or, you know, more sophisticated than Bang that was out like 40 years ago. But they're kind of basically, you know, very much the same really, reporting on our local culture, giving a voice to people who might not otherwise have a voice. So I think, yeah, it's still, there is a lineage, I think, that, that you can kind of trace. Through. In through the book you can kind of see this duplicator or this stepner that kind of changed hands a few times and then kind of voices start coming in and kind of the next generation. So there's this kind of handover thing that you can kind of trace something just to a degree. Has anyone worked on zines that aren't printed? No. That's <laughs> interesting isn't it? I mean can a zine be online? Yeah. yeah. So you did? Okay. Well, kind of. Uh, after uh, so, so it, I was just, money was just being lost with Nike Tongue and um, Claire by that point had the good sense to get out and <laughs> I didn't. Sorry! <laughs> <laughs> I carried on because it was kind of my baby so I just couldn't let it go and then, um, so then I started up a shop, <laughs> Shop Naked, which was going to sell the stuff, well it did sell the stuff that, that was being made by the people that we were writing about and then also it was going to go online but back then, it, the, it wasn't, the internet really wasn't quite what it is now. We didn't have Facebook. Well, if we, I don't think we had Facebook at all, did we? But it wasn't like it is now anyway. Happy, Maybe happy the times. Facebook. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, I tried to kind of put it online, but it was just like a, oh, it was, 
oh, it was labour, you know, it was just so laborious back then, it was really difficult to do. Did you use like a kind of blogging software? Yeah, we, we had to get someone in to help, didn't have a clue what we were doing, and it was, you know, you needed someone to know what they were doing back then. And um, so, yeah, we did, I did try to do it online, and it just didn't really work. Uh, I tried, many years later, I had a blog on mine, which was uh, a, a sort of a similar thing. Um, but yeah, that, but it, when I tried to make a time online, it was just a ball ache. <laughs> so, it sort of lasted four years. And yeah, 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 there were some sort of gaps at the end because um, it was just kind of a thing of going, like, what can we do next to make it work? And noisy but, lasted yeah. four years. Yeah. Is that kind of the, the, the label? It's like the Sisyphean kind of label of love, the four years is the maximum maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Is that actually yeah. probably, so that's the average age of a zine is four years. <laughs> Sounds quite good actually, it's quite good innings. I mean, have you found that, Russ, that, I mean, in, in I mean, because you were talking about the archive that... Um, is yeah, it, we've, got, we've got an archive, I, I work at London College, well, I call, he still call it London College of Printing, London College of Communication, yeah. it changed its name 20 years ago, but I refuse to accept it. <laughs> um, but uh, zine but there's, a, there's a zine archive there, um, which is growing. Uh, it's been interesting to see it grow, and it, and it, and it charts, uh, back to the early 70s, they, they did some earlier stuff. They've got, a, they've got a historic book collection now that goes back to the sort of 14th century. Uh, but uh, but they, this, this zine archive comes right through to more contemporary zines. Um, and it's good to see that expand. I was just going to wonder, I was wondering in terms of this future scene, while I, while I think of it, whether if we've got this idea of a counterculture and pamphleteering and the idea of a the, the drive to create something, to create an alternative space, an alternative media. Is there any opportunity? Would, would, would there be an interest in a, something that reacts against the online culture and reacts against Facebook and everything to sort of move back into this space that says that's the mainstream culture that we want to object to uh, or move away from? But you know, I, I'm, yeah, is there something in there's something of value in these in these objects? Uh, and there's a a community that could build around these objects without going online, without being reflected on Facebook. I see it in band culture and gig culture all the time where there's, a, there's various people that moan because we're old punk rock fans that, oh, we don't hear about gigs because they're just advertised on Facebook and, uh, and, and there's a kind of reaction against it. But people say, no, we want to go back to flyers, we want to go back to handbills, we want to go back to you know, real communication. That there is a, um, you know, for something that might be a level of sustainability, it's got, you know, the guilt of producing printed matter. I, it's, it's something that's worth, I mean, I'm a big print fan, I, I love, I, I'll pick up a magazine, I still buy magazines. Uh, you know, back in 2006 or whatever, I struggled to sell an A5 fanzine to 50p. Yeah. Which, you know, was it because people didn't want to read it or they struggled for the cash? Who knows? So I'd, I'd, love, I'd love, I think, yeah, absolutely, a print, uh, return to print would be lovely, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it would happen. Well, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, because of perhaps you don't want to, you know, there is a sustainability. I think, that's, I think that's a valid point. And yeah. I think, I mean, I've, I've, on the like, lower level, I do, I do work in, sort of in media and things, and even like we, we produce catalogues, and there's a, there's a level of guilt about producing yeah. a catalogue that you could keep can look for free online at. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I love, I love print, but I don't know, I don't know if, if print's the future or it's the future. One, one comment to respond to it is a debate that goes on at work because we're obviously there's a big sustainability agenda in higher education. I'm sure Graham can talk to this. I would argue that microchips and banks of servers are more it have more detrimental impact on the uh, on the environment than pieces of paper. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another point that, that's in the book, um, there was the Hecla. Uh, unfortunately, the guy who runs the Hecla is now moved down to Bristol, but they used to put, put that out and you could pick up piles of that, you know, they'd be piles of that in, in the railway. And he makes the point that actually um, a good reason for keeping print publications going, keeping them out there, is because I guess a lot of what's on, you know, we're seeing this through kind of censorship and stuff, you know, like. Zuckerberg or whatever, you know, if they decide um, we don't want to hear these views anymore, we're going to shut these views down. 
you know, those views won't be on Facebook, or won't be in social media, but when we've still got the pamphlets and the little, you know, the tradition of the Samistat publications that were put out, you know, as kind of revolutionary publications, um, very difficult to censor those, especially if you actually own the means of production, you know, if you've actually got your own printer, your own got duplicator or whatever, you know, or you just like, you know, your printer in your own back room or whatever, you know, very difficult to have control over that in the same way that kind of social media and the internet is kind of controlled, you know, so there is that aspect as well, I believe. So you know whose eyeballs are going to be on it, because algorithms are quite hard to predict, and I think you have to, I think that's effective communication, but <coughs> the type of communication that um, people are kind of encouraged to put out there is actually often quite sensationalist, or it's sort of going a certain way, and it's like this, you know, printed seem like, um, uh, subvert that or get around that and also you don't really want the scenes in the metaverse do you because it's not going to work no yeah. absolutely yeah <laughs> right, um, I'm, I'm intrigued just to go back to the archive where do, where do where do zines stop being pamphlets or like when does it when do when do, when do uh, you when, I'm when does not the archive answer this because I'm not I'm not the archivist right, uh, okay. and I don't I don't ever really see or manage the archive I think I I probably have some questions myself for the archivists about how they categorise. Uh, and it's a library, it's an extension of a library and the historic books collection and it's a zine collection and there's a massive interest. We, got, we get a lot of student interest in it and a lot of uh, visiting academics uh, who want to study the history of fanzines or particular aspects, Riot Girl or whatever it might be, feminism in fanzines or uh, particular issues in relation to fanzines and they can go and do a search and they can find out those, those trajectories which is fantastic. And where we're talking materiality, and one other point actually on, in relation to sustainability, I spoke to a photographer many years ago who said that there was a shift back to printing photographs as archival work because they, they last longer than digital files. The digital files actually don't have a sustainability uh, along a life, life expectancy uh, in comparison to print. So there are there's archival aspects to, to print materials. Uh, but anyway, coming back back to that, I think um, uh, it's interesting to see an archive, and I am passionate about the idea of ephemera that was seen as graphic ephemera, that was transitory, that was momental, of a time and of a period, as becoming historic documents of importance. And that's really, I've spent the last 25 years working in punk subcultures and documenting something. And my, my PhD was about punk in the wider regions of the UK. It was about how it, tra how it, tra how it materializes in different ways in different towns, in different cities across the country, um, over time and how it changes. And I'm really interested in that as kind of historical document documentation of something and social and cultural history. And I think that's where the fanzines and the archive of fanzines is hugely important and, must, and shouldn't be ignored. Having looked at the country at large, is there a kinship um, between places that would have produced these sort of uh, punk scenes or, you know, that would have a subculture that would sustain a zine, or, or is it just, is it actually a bit too I'll complex? I guess there is. I think there's, there's, there's moments of, um, uh, where you, you get a critical mass of people involved in something. That's, I imagine South End rather than one of the smaller towns along the coast in Essex or something might be, you get kind of a, a critical mass or a gravitational pull towards certain centres. What I found in graphic language, if you like, of punk scenes around the country is the classic stereotype is people take a photograph of themselves outside in front of a local landmark. Every, every punk record cover from, uh, from Blackpool would have a Blackpool town in it or, or from wherever they, wherever they were, it would be a photograph in, terms of, in, in the place where they congregate in the town centre. To feel good had a jetty. Yeah. 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 So it is, it, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of staple, visual staple of, of locality. And I'm sure that's reflected in fanzine culture as well. I'm sure South End fanzines had the stereotypes of South End in them visually. But you can tell me. Because you I mean, um, there is a sort of tension between the zine being something that we want to look to the future through because we're trying to um, pass on information about new ideas because a lot of this is about alternative culture and how to get that out there. And there's this tension between that and the, the kind of archiving and, uh, you know, it becoming a nostalgic um, thing. 
what, like, how, do, how do you see, I mean, do you, do you, I don't know if you wake, stay awake at night fretting about the future of the zine, but like, is, you know, do, you, do, you have a, do you have an opinion on what, what that future might be, or, what, or whether it's just maybe a term that needs, that needs to evolve? I mean, after all, it means fanzine. It's kind of, it, mean, it kind of means you're paying tribute to this sort of thing that, that is or was rock and roll. Um, I think, or, or, yeah, or but, find a new life. But then the history of fanzines goes back so much further that the 1930s, 40s fanzines were about film, science fiction, um, a whole group set of interests. So it's interest groups and pamphlets that re bring together community in interest groups. We've, we've kind of come to a stereotype of the fanzine being a music, being a music fanzine, being something that's about uh, a, a subculture and a scene, but actually it predates that by some distance. And subsequent to that kind of subcultural pin pinnacle, I would say probably from the 1970s to 2000s, I'm old, so I'd say I'd say you know subcultures kind of died out more recently in the last 20 years, or the notion of tribal subcultures in the way that they were. And just so briefly, why do you think that is? Because I think young people are too. Um, uh, Young people today, I think young people today, <laughs> they're, they're, too, they're too inclusive and they're too forgiving. I think, uh, I, think, I, think, I think tribal subcultures, if you could get lumped for having the wrong haircut, then that was belonging. And I think, uh, and I think there's something in that that we've, we've lost. There needs to be more hate. If we're going to have a future of subculture, there needs to be more hate. And I do remember avoiding... <laughs> I do remember avoiding South in Sea Funk because I, I didn't want to get punched. Uh, that was the nineties into noughties and I did make the mistake of wearing a duffel coat on South in High Street and I got punched. Um, no, don't no, it was it was fine, it was just part of the uh, it's just like, part of crossing the road back then. Um, but um, but no, I, I mean I think we should celebrate that. I think there's I think there's something in that that's, that has value that we that we well, there isn't this kind of, so yeah, I mean, I suppose with some culture there isn't this, um, like, life or death element <laughs> to it. Like, but it's true, right? I mean, it's like, like these um, symbols, I mean, yeah. there's like the subcult subculture of Style by Dick Hedges is that book that yeah. kind of starts that whole analysis of, um, you know, punk iconography and what style actually meant. And yeah. so you're having, I mean, we talk about a culture war. I mean, it's quite funny we talk so much about culture war now. We don't see much evidence apart from on Twitter, where it's actually back then, there was a kind of a physical culture that spill out onto beaches between like modern rockers and things yeah. like that. Um, but so, do you, so you're saying like maybe maybe the scene is the, the conditions aren't really perhaps. I think the conditions yeah. are different. I think the fanzine, the gravitational pull, moved the fanzine or zine culture into a different space. Of the game. I, I would say I don't know. The, the, these young ladies can tell me. Um, uh, did it become more diaristic? Did it become more personal? Did it become sort of less, less is it yeah. more community? Is it yeah, I wanted to move on to you, Sophia, because yeah. um, what, I mean, what, why, I mean, was there a reason, was it just life going away and then sort of stopped it? Or was there, how did you feel like you were seeing sad in, in the wider landscape? Did you feel, I mean, was it part? Of, I mean, did it sit among others, or and and, and did you feel there was a subcultural aspect to it? That I, I think there probably were. There were others. There were certainly other people publishing and talking about what was going on. Not just geeks, but you know, perhaps alternative art exhibitions, vintage shops. You know, everything that would come under a broad umbrella of an alternative uh, culture. Um, but I suppose, yeah, it is just it becomes a second job. And uh, you know, when you're working a job and, and you're sort of, you know, oh, I've got a huge load of emails to go through, I've got a stack of CDs to listen to, and after work I'm going to go to XYZ gig. When you, I, I don't, don't want to say I ceased enjoying it because I did, but it became something I had to do. I felt more than that I necessarily wanted to do. And I think every, everybody I met was lovely, everybody was supportive, but I, I couldn't have done it without the. Um, the friendship and help of people that used to, friends that used to drive me to gigs, um, Phoenix FM, who were a radio station in Brentwood of Billericay, still going and really supportive of, of music scenes and local bands. Um, Steve Pegram, who's not here, but he, he ran South End Punk at the time, he was, which is a website and archive of, of, of Graham knows him well, obviously. 
Is that still going? Sadly, it still exists as a website. It is a, a compilation CD, and yeah, yeah. So definitely check it out, southampunk.com. Um, you should be southampunk. Um, but yeah, for me, I just I, I never intended to stop. I had I had interviews done, I had reviews written, but it just got you know a year went by, and, and I should say that the the last issue that we did came with a free CD. It was a very reasonable price of a pound. And I had about 250 done, which was the biggest print run for us so, uh, thus far. And I really wanted to sort of have, obviously send as many copies as possible. And we, we weren't great, great sales people, did, did the best I could. So I sort of thought, well, I'm not going to do another issue yet. I'm going to wait and see how many copies I can sell. You know, went to 18 months, went to two years, and you sort of think, oh, maybe I should just sort of say to people, look, I'm not going to do another one now. Thanks for your support. And, uh, yeah. See you around, and that's so. It, it was just a, a, a gradual demise, rather than anything, any one thing. I guess. Where did you, you know? sell? Did you sell them at gigs, or did you kind of mail order? Yeah, we we I had them on me at gigs. I mean, I wasn't I say I wasn't the greatest salesperson. We had a few, probably a couple of shops. I think maybe five stocked. It can't really remember. Oh, okay. A couple, a couple of maybe a couple of other record shops. Um, Mushroom rehearsal studios had copies. Um, so yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't an easy sell. But that's what, you know I, I, I know that makes me sound bitter, and I'm not <laughs> honest. But um, but yeah, and it's just you know how long would you keep doing this? And you know we we there's a lot of interest, but the interest was generally from the people that were in it and were in the scene rather than perhaps the man on the street. But then maybe that is that what it's kind of about? It's about like you know it's a it's a kind of it's a it's a means to create a sort of a community yeah, or, 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 or allow each other to feel like you're doing something. It absolutely wouldn't have existed if, if there wasn't a, a huge community here and, and in other places in Essex that supported it and were reviewed in it and abs it absolutely wouldn't have had legs. It wouldn't have gone past the first couple of issues if I didn't meet some amazing people who supported me and supported this. So, um, yeah, yeah, it was absolutely about community, yeah. Um, I don't know how I mean, for time, what's the... Well, we could do a Q&A now. Yeah. You're finished, yeah? I think so. I don't know how long we've been or what day it is anymore. Okay, <laughs> okay so we've done this sort of 15 minutes. Hang on. I'm on. Shall I just see if there... I'll give you your, your mic. <laughs> what's that? Sorry. Do, do you want to take... <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I have. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, yeah. I'm on the mic. The only thing is, it's, uh, it's not Wi Fi technology, so we've got. Oh, it's just loud. So, we've got some questions, yeah? So, it's QA? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, I think what you do, you put your hand up. You're first. Okay. You're second. I'm second. Right. But I can only reach certain people. So okay. hold on to your drinks for the wires coming okay. past. My name's Angela, and what I want to say to you is you were mentioning about hate. There should be more hate. I know it was just a joke. I thought it was You mentioned about hate. Well, what I thought was good when I bought this book, right, this, or this, is with it came a badge, and something like on the badge says, joy, peace, and love, and I couldn't need more of that. I, I've revised my opinion, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, did, I mean, you do feel that. I mean, I know we talked about punk, but that there's very much a kind of post hippie you know, in that book, there is very much a kind of like, sit the, the long 60s coming through. It's not just punk, it's kind of feeling for them. Yeah. I think maybe I should qualify my position a little bit, but I think, I think partly what I'm talking about here, I was going to ask a question in, in terms of the follow up discussion there is. It's about community, and we've talked about community, but I think communities are things that are um, that have uh, limits and have uh, have, a, have a community and have, a, a, have participants within that community. And part of the value of the subcultural community to me when I was growing up was being the cool kids in this community and not the uncool kids in a different community. And I think that's still something that you know there's, there's still something insular about community, which is and I, and I mean that in a positive way, not a negative. So it could be the insular community of South End. South End you know, is a great place and we must celebrate something about us and our scene and our, and our community. 
And that's kind of what I'm getting to get. I know I'm being very facetious about being punched and, and that kind of thing. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to touch upon. It's a bit, it's a bit like minor, you know, minor cultures and minor literatures like yeah. against the dominant culture, like South End would be articulated. Which is, which is why Graham's starting a fanzine that says, well, okay, there are all these bands are playing the sort of boring blues uh, in, in the past. We want to do something different. We want to stand out because we're, we're the cool kids that are into something else. And that's the driver, whether it's whether it's them in 1977, 76, 77, or you guys in the 1990s or whatever. We're we're setting ourselves apart from the the, the, the sticks of rock and funny hats crowd or whatever it might be. Otherwise, we're communal and we oh everybody's included and, and we're, we're they're all part of us. And I don't think they are. I think we're, I think it's exclusivity. I think just one thing we, we have a sorry. We have a question over here. Oh, okay. It's just a comment. Um, <coughs> I think that South End in particular, and now time with, I think, Mushroom, to Precinct Press, and into Saga, that era was, and, and what Trevor Taylor's in Prove, and I was talking to Adrian, and at that time, South End had censorship. Theatre, cinema, you weren't allowed to sell anything political or anything in the Precinct, which is why Precinct Press was that pertinent. And also, I think, you know, well, we sold socialist work, and not because we were part of that shit, but um, be because it was technically illegal, and uh, it was very successful, unfortunately. Well, it's an anarchist, <laughs> but there you go. Well, so, but I think that's the precedent that, that moves, moves you into the, the zine scene, or DIY, and, and it's... And, and I think pamphleteering is, goes way, way back. That radical tradition. We're just a part of that. I don't, think, I don't think that was totally reflected with respect. Right? <laughs> are, you, are you saying <laughs> South? Are you saying South End? South End itself was like the border. You go into the borders of South End, and it, and there is censorship. Um, you may not be aware of yeah, but I mean. If, what you could see in the cinema, or yeah. what was on in the theatre, was, yeah. So, if you were in South End, maybe you're not aware of it. If right. you went to London, you could see maybe... You're trying to make it big so, so, so it's like a kind of, yeah, okay. So it's like a paucity of options. Can, can I just add a little thing to that, uh, Rob? Um, but yeah, I don't know how many people in this room remember, but we actually had South End Borough Council actually ban the film uh, Life of Brian. Yes. So if you want to, I mean, me, me and my mum, we had to go to Basildon and see Life of Brian. So <laughs> if you want to remember, that was South End Council. You know, you talk about gatekeepers. I mean, they were, and yeah, my actual line manager, he was one, he was a councillor. He was very proud of the fact that he helped, to, you know, ban that film. So yeah. So we've got another question, I mean. Sorry, again, it's a comment. I'd just like to speak on behalf of uh, my friend Greg, who used to run the Progression Fantasy. And obviously there's tales of disillusionment here, but he sold them by the bucket load. Like, he had, he, we had a lot of fun. And we used to print 500, 1,000 of them and sell them all. And uh, they would have a free CD or a free single. He would phone up like Pavement or First of More and say, oh, can I have a track from a CD? And then a week later, one would drop through the door on a tape. And he was just one of those people. And um, I now run Ship for Bombs, which is the local sort of indie station. And we, we have to pay 20 quid to Facebook for them, for the people that like us to actually see our advert. Do you see? Uh, and he, which is insane. So we've got two, three thousand followers, and for all of them to see it, we have to pay 20 quid. So, you know, the fact that Greg would bang these magazines out everywhere, you know, he was reaching so many more people than we ever were. But in terms of evolution, I'd just like to say my daughter writes um, about anime and stuff like that online, and she has like hundreds and thousands of followers. And it's more than really, uh, you know, music isn't what it was, and um, games and uh, anime, and particularly Jap Japanese culture, has an enormous following in the UK. And I think that the scene's moved, and you might, you know, music's hard to see online. And, you know, I, I've been in bands for years, and it's hard to get seen. But um, you know, if you find your niche, she's got friends all around the world, and you talk about the community, it is there, but it's maybe just not for us. You know, it's for the youngsters. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good point. Um, what, what platform does she use? Yeah, yeah.
I mean, yeah, you can, and you can, video content is very accessible now. I mean, this is like, it's not necessarily something to be either or about either, is it? It's like, it's not binary. I think it's, it's an evolution to these new technologies. I've got a, a quick question. Um, the, um, so a couple of times there was a mention of uh, exclusivity. There was a kind of mention of a kind of mainstream alternative. So one of the ways that gets articulated, that relationship between the mainstream and alternative, is that there's something incredibly conservative and reactionary about the, the mainstream. The, there's something inherently progressive about the alternative. Another way of thinking about that is actually that those claims for an alternative culture actually are actually built on kind of snobbery and, and status, right? So um, I'm struck by when Russ was talking about kind of maybe one of the most progressive ways of thinking about fanzines is less about that they were saying something inherently progressive at a certain time. And it's really just an anthropological exercise in here's what people were doing at that moment. So I'd just like to hear a bit more from the panel about, you know, what, what ultimately is the legacy? Are we really making claims for this was, this was actually championing some, this was actually promoting something that was really worth promoting? Or are we just saying this is interesting because it shows how young people were behaving at that particular moment? Does everyone want to? Like answer that. Um, yeah, I, I felt that there were things that um, you know were important to write about that weren't were getting uh, coverage. I, I, as I said, I was working as a journalist on a newspaper in sort of East London, Essex, uh, before that, and so I felt that there were, I really wanted to write about things that weren't were never going to get covered in the newspaper, and there's a lot of that now, you know, because. It's a business, and um, but I also think it it also is just when it's just you know someone does it because it's just all about the love and they just want to express themselves or express the, um, the you know their their culture. That's obviously really important too, as Graham was saying earlier. You know when you look back at some of the stuff and realise what was going on, it's it's amazing. It's it's just like a treasure chest. This book. <laughs> um, yeah. So, on uh, Andy's question. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, I'll give you a tangible example. So, um, I, I don't know if, um, if Ian's in the room tonight, but the, um, I wrote a, a feature for the uh, first edition of Trawler, right? And what struck, and, and you very generously said, uh, Graham, that, you know, Trawler is a kind of in a. You know, there's a, that it was it was a kind of culmination of a kind of great tradition. Okay? Actually, you know, Trawler, in my you know, from my perspective, was about a kind of branding on the of Leon C, right? It was kind of quite commercial. It was kind of saying, come here, it's cool, it's funky. It appealed to people who were coming from London wanting to kind of, you know, invest in property because they'd made a packet in their, you know, flat from London. It didn't feel very subcultural to me, right? You know? Now I hope nobody else is. It was part of that magazine. It was here, but um, so you know. So 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 for, for me, there was there was a kind of there was a, a difference between that magazine and, a, and an earlier moment where it did feel, perhaps you know, my argument is a bit naively. It did feel that an earlier moment was about a kind of some a kind of resistance, a, a kind of like here's what we're doing. It's not being recognised. It's not being acknowledged, and we're kind of giving voice to voices that wouldn't be heard. So I'm just trying to, I guess I'm just trying to be a bit critical of that idea that maybe we end up, you know, eulogising things that are kind of, um, aren't terribly progressive, really, is my question. Yeah, maybe, yeah, you've probably got a good point. Um, yeah, because there were, I mean, I guess a lot of other publications, the trawler, some of the other later ones, seem to have kind of a relationship with the council, you know, you know and, I think and local number, businesses as well. And local businesses, whereas, you know, going back to Bang, for example, which was kind of early ni early to mid nineteen seventies, was very critical, you know, like always sort of, you know, critical of the council, sort of, you know, or, or local business and this, that and the other, and so, you know I'm not saying anything that's gonna end up with a, a libel suit or something, but you know, they they kind of like point at kind of 
local corruption and things within the council and stuff like that, you know. So that yes, yeah, so I think you're quite right there, and that was part of the role, I think, you know, of these publications was to be, you know, a voice outside of that, kind of saying, look, what's going on here? Where's this money going? Why is this happening? Why haven't we got an art centre? Why, you know? So there is, yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, nothing. Thank you. Is that it? I'd like to hear Graham read something from his book. Hello. I'd like to hear Graham read some of his book. Just a few. Most of them actually other people in that word. So we. Do you want book? Graham's going to do reading for the book. Uh, I'm quite happy to, but I'm also aware that other people haven't had a chance to address the last question. Maybe do something in a minute. Uh, I guess my, uh, my comment regarding the last question would be, certainly when I started, it was definitely, uh, we felt something wasn't getting attention, we, we, we thought we should give it attention. Looking back on it now, if you were to look at the sheer amount of... Um, and whatever were f that were fo featured in each um, each issue. I mean, it's it's just it's just overload. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's it's very much a document of the time. But um, yeah, it's. I mean, as I, we were chatting earlier, I, I said it, it was never my intention to um, have it as an income stream or have it really looking any glossier than, than this. It was it was what it was. People who were interested picked it up. People who preferred the, the glossy manuscript would head that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a snapshot of a moment in time, but uh, perhaps almost too, you know, too in depth. But you know, how, how many people now are going to be interested in about, you know, 60 bands that, that played within a three month period in, in the SS? <laughs> That's what I mean. Me. <laughs> it's an incredible document. Yeah. Isn't that its value? That the very yeah. fact that it's documenting that stuff. Absolutely. Otherwise, we wouldn't know that, would we? Yeah. I think, from my point of view, I'm going to come across as a complete controversialist tonight. Um, I think that there's, a, there's a, almost a lazy assumption about progressive values, and I think I'm, 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 I'm very cynical about the term progressive anyway. Uh, but um, and, there's, and, and the way that the archives then work, because we, we're tying in with the mainstream culture, so from the punk visual language, if you like, or the fanzine language has been appropriated and used to sell trainers and youth culture and everything else, it's basically been bastardised and turned back into a, a commercial entity, um, as did the whole movement. Um, and, uh, and also that there's, there's almost this assumption of counterculture, therefore it's revolutionary, progressive and for the, for the, for the value of good. And a lot of my work, I've kind of moved away from, from what I used to write about punk studies, and I'm a kind of a design, designer and a design historian, and uh, I'm really interested in graphic design and the history of design. And I write about punk and comedy, I write about punk and humour, I write about neo-Nazi punk, I write about alternative um, stories that are undocumented in relation to that history uh, and that graphic history. So, I, so I'm quite kind of cynical about this kind of channeling it down and narrowing it down. And I think the archives ought to reflect that diversity and we should be able to unpack it from, from the archives rather than being told, well, this is the... Kind of monoculture of, of, of so a you're an anthropologist. <coughs> well, I guess I am. Yeah. So we've got a request for Graham to do yeah. some reading, and we've got some more questions for the for you guys. Come on. Yeah. I can see a hand over there. I tell you what, while, while waiting, what do you want? I can see some more people over there. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to microphone. My quick question for Sophia and Kelly. What, so I, I love popular culture and I, and I love going to gigs, I love hearing different perspectives, and I love zines back in the day. Um, but what were the biggest, what's the biggest motivation for you to do it? Because I could never, I couldn't be bothered to do anything like that. But why why do you, and it's not very financial reward, but why would you do it? Is it purely love for the scene? Love, love for the scene? But yeah, that's what I'm interested in. I think um, probably an inherent nosiness. I just I like to know what's going on, and I like to know what people's motivations are in terms of making music. Um, I, I like I, I still like writing. Uh, yeah, and I just I just felt that the bands I was featuring, and, and or anybody that had like a, a DIY project on the website, like Steve South and Punk website, or um, you know Phoenix FM and their community radio, just deserved to be. Um, 
uh, sort of draw to the attention of, of, of their audience, so help them get a bigger audience and, and tell people what was, what was going on locally. So that was my motivation, basically. Excellent. We have another question from our audience here. Hang on. Okay, do you want to respond to it? Sorry. Uh, so my motivation really was, um, as I said, I felt I was working as a journalist um, anyway, and um, I just felt that there was so much going on, you know, underground, if you want to use that word, that, that would never get covered. So there was a passion for that. There was a real passion for this kind of, for focusing on these independent artists, musicians, comedians, you know, every, everybody. Um, but also, you know, I wanted to run a magazine, and I did try to run it as a business because I wanted to make it work and I wanted to make it, wanted to be able to afford to be able to do it every day and, and so that was a motivation as well that I wanted to make it my job. Good point. <laughs> one over here first. Hi, um, I'll just make one quick comment before I sort of ask you a question. Uh, when you were talking about um, how perhaps wasteful going back to paper would be in as opposed to uh, staying digital, the Daily Mail gets printed every day, and it's millions. <laughs> and if that's not wasting trees, I don't know what it is. That was, that was a <laughs> uh, 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 I sort of see the, the zine scene and the bands and so on, the culture that was uh, represented or is represented in it, as Sort of almost the other way around, it's the grassroots. You get featured in a, a, a zine in the hope that the NME will pick up on it. In the, that you'll, you, you would get, go sort of up the tree rather than rejecting That's the a good point. Tree. That is a good point. So I don't know, uh, it's a feeder almost. Yeah, did you, did you, you kind of see it as that? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good, actually, yeah, and now because of my menopausal brain, and also because of so many, I can't remember who we featured, that, that you know, how, how it did go on to do amazing things, and also some of the people that we had writing for us, and designed for us, did go on to do really, really well, and I just can't remember who, can you remember anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Russ, um, Russ is going to yeah, I was going to kind of ask rather than rather than say that a lot of the um, punk fa early punk fanzine writers, producers went on to success successful careers in journalism. Uh, so Danny Baker and Gary Bushell and various other people uh, were writing writing fanzines. Uh, Paul Morley, etc. So um, is there something uh, kind of in here? I never made a fanzine. I gave up writing at the age of 13 and hated it. Uh, is there something, uh, a kind of literary bent in the fanzine producer? Did you, did you want to write? Or is there a, some, some, some truth in the sense that fanzine writers are failed musicians? Uh, but, you know, you're not in a band, so therefore... They wrote this. Yeah, they wrote this. So is, is there something... Is, 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 is there a kind of literate aspect that you're into reading, you're, you, you like reading, you like writing, and therefore that's the contribution you can make to the scene rather than bashing the drums or, or, or playing a guitar or something. Is that, is that part of your contribution to the culture? Yeah, it was absolutely about that as well. Yeah, I was a writer, I did do it for a living, um, and then as I say, I, I, I left my job, my mate Claire over there, who did, did the advertising, she sold the advertising, she left a job at ITV selling uh, advertising, uh, airspace, and I left a job on a, on a good newspaper. And I just, yeah, that, well, that was a big part of it, because I was a writer and I loved yeah. it, and yeah, I wanted to do my own thing, yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of music writing. Uh, Failed musician, well, I, I don't know, I think it was definitely my contribution, yeah, to, to help in, in the way that I, I felt like it, which was promotion. Um, I suppose going back to the comment that somebody made regarding the, you know, you're going to be picked up by NME, well, I think, obviously, a lot of the bands we featured, we wanted them to get a bigger audience, so there was that. Did I think uh, an NME uh, journalist was going to pick up my fanzine? Probably not. We, we sent a few copies to Stephen Mack, never got a response. That was a big fan of his show, anyway. <laughs> okay. but yeah, so, so it's a little bit of both. It was, yeah, it was, it was being part of the scene in, in a way that you could, I suppose, yeah. So you, you hit the man on the head, I think, yeah. 
We have another audience. Um, <laughs> failing musicians. Artists. The actual zine is, is an artifact. Um, you know, it's a piece of art. You, you're a creative who's making it. You are making art. And the art is about critique of the culture that you're in. You know, all, all great art reflects the culture that it comes from. And then that goes back to the point of what materials you use, you know, it's all part of it. So, are we just not all artists? <laughs> <It's a good laughs> I mean, you response, please. Uh, my, my, I think I said, are we not all artists? Yeah. I think that uh, my response is, thanks for coming, Dad. Uh, this, is your, this is my old man, yeah. <laughs> but, um, well, that, that, that actually, the thing is with this book, some of these, some of these um, very zines, my dad was mates with, and what his bands were in, in them when I was growing up. So, like things like Food Bar, and he said, food, Food Bar had a, a, a name that was banned. So I can't the, remember what it was. <laughs> he had an initial name that was, they, the, the, when it was what it was called the first time, it was to South End, was it South End Council banned it? There's a lot of banning that went on with the scenes. So Is there anybody else's dad in the audience? <laughs> oh, Graham! Graham! Oh, your mum's over there. Yeah. Can you have a question for Graham? Uh, she's so proud of you, bro. How are we? Anybody else with questions? Come on. Yeah. So we need the reading, don't we? The oh, reading? Yeah. We, we, should we finish up the reading? Graham's going to do some sort of, you know, like, uh, <laughs> This bit's about his mum. It's like Percy Shelley. <laughs> 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 I haven't got respect, so I'm going to... Oh, who's going to ask you? Anyone going to ask you? Oh! Um, yeah, I did want to read things too. Um, there isn't much I can read in it because most of it isn't my voice. It's other people's voices. Ooh. Um, all I did was like just leave a microphone running. Um, but you did it brilliantly, uh, what, what I'll do, um, I'll just read a little piece out, um, which is maybe a little prequel to this because this book covers. 1971 to 2021. So it's kind of a little bit of a, a, a prequel, a little bit of a tone setting for the book. Kind of round type, obviously South End. Um, as I'm sure most people know, there's a South End of Pretty Well, so it's nothing more than a little kind of fisherman's hut or a very small community. Um, and then rose to kind of prominence with the arrival of the railways in the kind of 19th century and became kind of a holiday destination. People come here for day trips from East End of London and all that and then of course that started to decline as travel abroad became affordable. Um, so there's a little bit of tone setting there. So during the 1960s after you know the kind of decline you know was no longer the vogue destination for day trippers. So during the 1960s, decisions were made to modernise in inverted commas and rebuild much of South End's infrastructure, including concerted but far from wholly successful attempts to leave behind its now unfashionable, saucy, stroke, seedy, seaside postcard image. New town planning policies encourage commerce and retail development and much of the housing in Victoria Avenue was demolished to make way for high-rise office blocks. Within a few years, most of the old Victorian and Edwardian built high street, shopping arcades and market areas had also been swept away to be replaced by the bleak brutalism of the multi-storey Hammerson development, aka Victoria Shopping Precinct. The 1970s had arrived but not everybody shared the South End Corporation planning officer's vision 
of recasting the town as a brave new shopper's paradise. And that's kind of... Maybe sets the scene for the rest of the book. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to clap twice because we're going to clap that one, which is fantastic. We're going to have to also clap the whole panel because they clap.